cannabis common sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have another great show for you tonight. We have a couple videos from our friend Jorge Cervantes about harvesting cannabis. And if you're here in Oregon, it is October, sometimes known as Croptober. And so uh, we'll be talking a bit about that tonight. If you have any questions about harvesting or uh, uh, anything else having to do with cannabis, well, you're watching the right show. Give us a call. Uh, after the news and after John sings a song. John Cornette is back tonight. Welcome back, John. John's doing double duty tonight. Not only is he going to be playing music, he is also uh, here to co-host. Our, our other guest oh, got sick. That means you're going to sit there and we'll, we'll try to keep the show rolling for uh, at least the next 58 minutes or so. So stay tuned as we will come back with our hemp news. But first, as we've done for 15 years uh, on our 23-year-long quest on this program, uh, we'll come back with our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. Force. All right, our first story tonight is from Washington, D.C. The total number of persons arrested in the United States for violating marijuana laws rose, that's right, went up for the third consecutive year. Uh, what else happened about three years ago? Uh, oh, yeah, there was a big change in the federal government. Uh, oh, yeah, we had President Trump come in, right? According to data released by the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, according to the FBI's Uniform Crime Report, Police made 663,367 arrests for marijuana-related violations in 2018. That's more than 21% higher than the total number of persons arrested for the commission of all violent crimes put together, which was 521,103. Of those arrested for cannabis-related activities, some 90%, or 608,776, were arrested for marijuana possession offenses only. Police across America make a marijuana-related arrest every 48 seconds at a time when the overwhelming majority of Americans want cannabis to be legal and regulated. It is an outrage that many police departments across the country continue to waste tax dollars and limited law enforcement resources on arresting otherwise law-abiding citizens for simple marijuana possession. The year-over-year -year increase in marijuana arrests comes at the same time that several states, including California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Maine, and Massachusetts have legalized the adult use of cannabis. Illinois will legalize the adult use on January 1st, leading to a significant decline in marijuana-related arrests in those jurisdictions. But in the other jurisdictions, the arrests are going crazy. It also marks the reversal of a trend of declining arrests that began following the year 2007, when police made a record 872,721 total marijuana-related arrests in the United States. What happened in 2007 till 2008? Oh yeah, there was a big change in the administration. That's right, we went from Bush Jr. to Obama. Then the arrests started going down. Trump came in, the arrests started going up again. Hmm, marijuana-related arrests were least likely to occur in western states, most of which have legalized the substance, and were more prevalent in the Northeast, where they constituted 53% of all drug arrests. Meanwhile, our neighbors to the North have started to get it right. Out of Toronto, Canada, the enactment of nationwide legislation in Canada legalizing the use of cannabis has had little perceived impact on workplace safety 
our employees' performance according to survey data compiled by the Ipsos Market Research Firm and Commission, the Human Resources Group, ADP Canada, the employment group. Uh, the law in Canada isn't perfect. They've handed it all over to the big corporations and they're closing down all the mom and pop stores and they're, they're giving their uh, people in Canada substandard cannabis. But things will change. According to this survey, they reported recreational cannabis has had a smaller than expected impact on workplace performance. Most Canadians believe recreational cannabis has had no impact at work in terms of health and safety incidents. 75% believe that. In terms of productivity, 74% believe that. Absenteeism, 71%. Are the quality of work, 70%. These findings are in contrast to the perceptions held by Canadians prior to the legalization when nearly half presumed that the policy change would be associated with the decline in work quality and productivity and a rise in occupational accidents. Commenting on the survey results, an ADP Canada representative said, quote, there was a lot of uncertainty and hype leading up to cannabis legalization last year, but so far, cannabis has not had a noticeable impact on the workplace or on workplace performance, end quote. According to a 2017 literature review by the United States National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, quote, there's no or insufficient evidence to support a statistical association between cannabis use and occupational accidents or injuries, end quote. Out of Tel Aviv, Israel, the long-term use of whole plant cannabis is associated with both symptom improvement and the reduced use of prescription medications in patients with treatment-resistant inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, according to clinical data in the European Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Israeli researchers assessed the long-term effects of daily cannabis use in 127 patients diagnosed with intractable IBD. Most of the subjects in the study referred, uh, suffered excuse me, from either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Just under 70% of the study's subjects consumed herbal preparations of cannabis. Investigators reported that patients' overall symptoms improved significantly over a median period of 44 months and that subjects typically consume 30 grams of cannabis per month to achieve a therapeutic benefit. The researchers reported, quote, we found that most of the patients were satisfied with medical cannabis treatment and experienced prolonged improvement in disease-related symptoms, specifically abdominal pain and number of bowel movements per day. Improvement was also supported by the significant decrease in the clinically-based Harvey Bradshaw Disease Activity Index, end quote. The researchers further reported that cannabis therapy was associated with a significant reduction in patients' consumption of prescription medications, as well as weight gain and the increased likelihood of full-time employment. The researchers reported, quote, our findings demonstrate that the clinical improvement achieved with medical cannabis treatment was also associated with improvements in patients' daily functioning, end quote. They concluded, quote, in summary, this study presents a real-life cohort of long-term cannabis users with IBD. In this cohort, cannabis resulted in improvements in symptoms and general functioning. Long-term side effects were mild and optimal doses were defined. Cannabis is used by many IBD patients and our real-life data provides us with important information which can guide the management of these patients until more information is available." End quote. You know, this is the most studied plant in the history of man. They always want more information. Sure, yeah, we want more information. But that's no reason to not use it. No one's died from this stuff. Anyway, the full text of this study, Medical Cannabis for Inflammatory Bowel Disease, Real Life Experience of Mode of Consumption and Assessment of Side Effects, appears in this month's edition of the European Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Our next story is from Massachusetts. The use of cannabis is associated with a significantly reduced risk of Clostridioditis difficile infection, or CDI, according to data published in the journal Anaerobe. CDI is a bacterial infection often acquired in hospitals. It can cause life-threatening damage to the colon. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, quote, within a month of diagnosis, one in 11 people over the age of 65 dies of health care associated CDI, end quote. Investigators with the University of Massachusetts assessed the prevalence of CDI in nearly 30,000 cannabis consumers as compared to an equal number of non-using controls. 
they reported that those who consumed cannabis were 23% less likely than abstainers to acquire CDI during hospitalization, while habitual consumers were 80% less likely. The authors concluded that a history of cannabis exposure, quote, was associated with the decreased risk of CDI amongst hospitalized patients. Prospective and molecular mechanistic studies are required to elucidate how cannabis and its contents impact CDI, end quote. This study, Cannabis Use and the Risk of Clostridotis Difficile Infection, an analysis of 59,824 hospitalizations, appears in this month's edition of Anaerobe. Out of Pullman, Washington, the enactment of statewide legislation permitting adult cannabis possession and sales is not associated with any significant or long-term uptick in criminal activity, according to data published in the journal Justice Quarterly. The investigators affiliated with the Department of Justice and Criminology at Washington State University assess trends in monthly average crime rates in Colorado and Washington following legalization compared to various controlled states. The researchers specifically examined trends in violent crime, property crime, aggravated assault, auto theft, burglary, larceny, and robbery rates. They reported, quote, marijuana legalization and sales have, no, have had minimal to no effect on major crimes in Colorado or Washington. We observe no statistically significant long-term effects of recreational cannabis laws or are of retail sales on violent or property crime rates in these states." End quote. Consistent with these results of prior studies, the authors concluded the results related to serious crime are quite clear. The legalization of marijuana has not resulted in a significant upward trend in crime rates. Our results from Colorado and Washington suggest that legalization has not had major detrimental effect on public safety." End quote. Surprise, surprise. The full text of this study, The Cannabis Effect on Crime, Time Series Analysis of Crime in Colorado and Washington State, appears in Justice Quarterly. You know, I've been saying that for, for 20 years before they, we passed these legalization laws. And finally, we're getting the real science to prove we were right all the time. I said on CNN 10 years ago, if we follow the science and the facts, we will win. And that's what's happening. Our last story tonight. Some 4 in 10 adults reported using both marijuana and opioids within the past year acknowledge either decreasing or ceasing their consumption of opioids as a result of substituting cannabis, according to an analysis survey published in the journal PLOS One. A team of investigators affiliated with the San Francisco Veterans Affairs Medical Center assessed the prevalence of self-reported cannabis substitution in a nationally representative sample of pain patients among those who acknowledged recent use within the past 12 months of cannabis and opioids. 41% reported a decrease or cessation of opioid use due to marijuana use." End quote. The most commonly reported reasons for substitution were Better pain management, 36% said that. Fewer side effects, 32% said that. Withdrawal symptoms, 26% said that. Respondent's decision to engage in cannabis substitution was not influenced by either the legal status of cannabis in their state or by particular socio-demographics. The study's authors wrote, quote, in a nationally representative survey of U.S. adults, substitution of marijuana for opioids, which included a substantial degree of opioid discontinuation, 20% was common. The authors concluded, quote, our findings are consistent with prior surveys of American Canadian marijuana users in which substitution of marijuana for opioids was prevalent due to better symptom management and fewer adverse and withdrawal effects, end quote. The full text of this sub study, Substitution of Marijuana for Opioids in a National Survey of U.S. Adults, is available online. And that's the end of our hemp news segment for tonight. Mr. John Coronet, doing double duty, is uh, ready to play us a song. Hey, hey, John. Hey, Paul. How you doing? Very well. I don't hear anything coming out up there. I'm assuming, though, I'm on. I think you're on. <laughs> okay, great. A multi-talented individual. <laughs> you know, uh, I totally apply to that last story. I'm I know. just listening and thinking, man, what would I do without cannabis? I would probably be dead. Because um, the cannabis, the levels of the oil that I take help me tremendously with the extreme levels of chronic debilitating pain and also helps greatly with my seizures. So, Your seizure disorder. Big deal. And I have it on good authority. Even uh, Well, it's been speculated that what if God smoked cannabis? <laughs>
<laughs> if God had long hair and a goatee and if his eyes look pretty glazed if he looks spaced out would you buy his story would you believe he had an eye infection and yeah yeah God he looks baked yeah yeah God he smells good question there uh, I, I don't know what God does I, I don't know um, anyway we have a great show for you tonight we have a number of video clips John Cornett or I will be chatting here if you want to call us you can ask a question or if you're in our studio audience and I know one person in our studio audience Larry has a question so in our sound room should get the the studio mic going and uh, uh, welcome back John Hey. Uh, so, go ahead, Larry. Hey, Paul. Thanks hey. for doing the show. Congratulations. What's this like? Show eighteen thousand. One thousand and three. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, great song, John. You know, I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, um, "Man made alcohol, God made marijuana. Who do you trust?" I, I read that, that in a bathroom stall back in the seventies. Wow. I that on yeah. yeah. Nice one. For nice a long one. Time really? I, I actually saw that written at the <laughs> University of North Carolina in. A men's bathroom uh -huh. on okay. the wall. Couldn't say any truer. Long time ago. It was better than a lot of things I read in the bathroom stalls, I'll tell you that. But yeah, it's a, good, it's a, a true story. I mean, uh, uh, long-term use of beer uh, causes addiction. Long-term yeah. use of cannabis causes bronchitis and a cough, maybe. If you just vaporize it like I do, you won't even get that. Anyhow, I have a question for you. All right. Um, That's why we're here. Uh, like John and all the other people that uh, have, have you been able to use this cannabis to get off of the opioids, um, it's, uh, it's done wonders for me in reducing the amount of pills that I take. Uh, the amount of migraines that I have have, uh, have gone, uh, gone way down. But I still find myself not able to cure the pain just with cannabis. And I still need the pills, even though they're... Uh, there's their taboo and you know yeah. you hear the bad stories I've gone from 160 a month to uh, sometimes 30 a month that's a big but, difference but your body got built up a tolerance to 160 a month yeah, and so yeah. it's a lot better for your body that you're only using 30 well, because the, the side the, effect the cannabis kind of runs interference it uh, does you know, it in does. between that so anyhow my and it ex it it uh, helps with pain relief too. You know, well, it does, but it works on both the, of them. The debil debilitating migraines I get, <coughs> and I still need the pills. Anyhow, my problem is finding a doctor that will write me a prescription for those pills with cannabis in my system. I had mm -hmm. a doctor that was pretty nice and considerate, but bitch moved. So I had to find another doctor in there, you know, bringing the jar out and having to pee in it, and make excuses and all of these things. Is it possible to find a doctor that, that, that is uh, compassionate enough to write a prescription for those with THC in your system? I can share my experience. My experience is this. <clears throat> I had a, an established relationship with my family doctor, a uh, long time established, mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I never really sought pain medications when I, uh, up to a point with him, but then when my back crashed on me, I was, you know, fully engaged in work, and I couldn't get out of bed. And um, uh, uh, he would start, uh, well, he basically, they sent me to a, uh, he sent me to a, a uh, orthopedist specialist, and the orthopedist specialist verified to my doctor that this boy needs help. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they tested me and everything, put me through the ringer to make sure that I was indeed, a, I wasn't just trying to get some dope to get high, right? Because that's always a problem with us guys, you know, particularly if you've had any kind of history with opioids. What they consider uh, abuse or seeking, that's the thing I found that you got to watch out for. If you go to them and say, I just know I need some pills, they're going to say, yeah, seeking, and then that's on your chart, you know. So, uh, and then they won't give it to you, of course, if you're seeking. So I think the, the back door in is to, is to be tight with uh, someone who's addressing your specific problem, i.e. a specialist, because the specialist, they, I think they have more of a hand in writing the initial subscription saying you need this for this malfeasance, whereas the general practitioner or doctor DO, they're going to say, no, I'm not going to give you no opioids. Well, I had a general, uh, a general practitioner who was doing that because right? I had the MRI and I was diagnosed with the that herniated helps, disc course. and the operation wouldn't fix it. But she moved. She's no longer here. So now uh, I don't have that relationship like what you're talking about. Yeah. I have to go out and find a new doctor. Yeah, that's so finding, you're building that relationship is going to be real difficult. Like you say, am I just mm -hmm. searching yeah. these pills out or do I We really can help you. Yeah. I can tell you that. Yeah. Our doctor can help you. Uh, we just have to yeah. talk to him. Uh, there are doctors out there that are compassionate. Now, they have other impetus from the Board of Medical Examiners and some people who say you can't do them both at the same time. But uh, that just isn't true. You know, uh, the, the knowledge has been out there for a long time. And uh, we have doctors who can help you. If you have any of these conditions right here, then give us a call because we have doctors who can help. You can call us at 503 Two three five four six zero six. That's five zero three two three five four six zero six. I know, Larry, you didn't expect me to turn this into a, uh, didn't mean a to take up so much thing, of your time, but, but I it's knew true. You had the we have doctors who work with pain specialists, okay, and okay. who uh, who will be happy to help you with this. Awesome, yeah. So we are taking phone calls. If anybody out there in TV land, you know, it used to be our phone would just ring off the hook, but so many people have cut the cable cord. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching out there on the internet, we are streaming directly from our studio on facebook.com slash restore hemp. Tell your friends to watch us on Friday night. You can call in at our number, which is 503-288-4442. That's 503-288. 288-4442 and Judy is at the studio microphone ready to ask another question. Go ahead, Judy. On the same subject, um, I have not been aware of the state of Oregon formally like OHA um, or any, any other entity um, uh, talking about and promoting cannabis as an assistance to or a substitute for opioids. I, uh, this was a question that I wanted to ask you anyway before Larry uh, started talking about the subject. Uh, it, I just wanted to remind my husband <laughs> that the reason that his family practice, uh, our family practice doctor, can write what he writes for John in this combination, it's been a long process of education. However, my husband's been through the mill, as many of you know, with the pain management clinics, the, the best in town, having come very close to killing him, not just once, but by two different methods, one of them being the narcotics. And when he told them that he was done and set the stage and, and made his own um, recovery from that start, he required it, he pressed, he, it, was, it was practically a violent confrontation. I'm done. Don't write this prescription again for the same thing you've been writing it for. Wow. And so all the years later, after he'd been through all of that, then his family practice doctor could safely write for him at this minimal level because the cannabis is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this question about, is the state at any level um, promoting um, cannabis as assistance to or substitute for the opioid situation, the thing that we have seen 
over and over again over the years if you're an older um, person in this society is that we periodically go through these big pushes right with medical right now it's the opioid crisis which means a lot of pressure is being put on doctors to not write which also means then that very legitimate patients with very legitimate Suffering. needs um, start having a lot of trouble getting their needs met. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The medical community, many doctors, they f it's the herd mentality. You know, if they're talking about palliative care and uh, end of life uh, suffering, you'll see an increase in these uh, prescriptions. And if they're talking about opioid, you know, it's a herd mentality, and they listen to the herd. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think we have better friends, uh, better and more uh, safe and. Uh, reliable friends in terms of who we visit and who we pay our hard-earned money to for medical in the naturopathy field and homeopathy yeah. because those doctors actually can talk about it whereas the allopathic care I didn't know Paul until just this year you know I'm hearing this term allopathic care what does that mean it, okay it means a standard doctor thing you know AMA MD. and FDA and that kind of stuff but what it really means is thou shall not veer outside of this this very rigid uh, plan. If you do, you will be ostracized and, and kicked out because these other things work, like cannabis. They can't talk about cannabis. Cannabis mm -hmm. is a, what do you call it? A, a, a An herbal. Yeah, full, well, well, full it, spectrum. To the, for, the, for them, it's a death sentence. Plant. Because once they've signed on, then uh, immediately they, they don't get to go to the country club anymore. They don't get yeah, that's true. Around. Those pharmaceutical companies, yeah. the monomolecular mercantile madmen that feed us I this. Like that. The, the things like opioids and Oxycontin, you know, they are uh, uh, financing a luxurious lifestyle to the doctors who write the most prescriptions, on our, on our you know. Heads, on our heads. And, on our heads. yeah, on, on our heads and on our lives, on, mm -hmm. on our necks, you know. Our it's health, uh, our health. quite a shame. But, you know what? Oh, there's another person <laughs> at the microphone. The hey, phone they, calls are coming in, but our studio audience. And I want to let you know, you can come down here if you want on a Friday night and sit in on our studio audience. And if you have a question like these folks, you can go off camera and ask a question. And if you think you have a lot to say and you want to be a guest on the show, you can call us as well. But David, go right ahead. Paul, this is for you. Paul Stanford, medical marijuana helped me save my life. And you taught me how to get up, stand up for my rights. I just wanted to thank you for being you in front of the world tonight. Thank you, sir. I, I keep trying. It's a blessing to be able to help as many people as I can. I've been uh, uh, blessed in that regard, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. So, But you know what? It is harvest time, croptober, and there's a lot of stress. I know you've been working a lot, John. Yeah, beat myself up, my body. I couldn't, I, I couldn't even push myself out of bed this morning. It hurt so bad. Yeah, I got, you're lifting those big, heavy plants. Well, yeah, it, it kills me. listen, we have our favorite ganja expert here, Jorge Cervantes, will give us some tips about harvesting right now. Stay tuned. Okay, the harvest is underway. I've got my little scissors here to, uh, to trim this up, to trim off this uh, trellis. I could try to keep it, but it's really, really a lot of work to keep it. And so what's going to happen is I got, a, I got a busy day and all of that stuff. I got a little bit of help coming over. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, cut, these, cut these down, uh, trim off some big leaves real quickly, and throw them in the bin. So they're sitting there, and then we're just going to trim them over the course of the next couple of days. So um, let's take a look. And I know that's not the best way to do it, but here's the deal. A lot of times you just got to do what works for you and what you have time for. Myself, I'm, I'm busy pretty much 24-7 uh, these days, so this is what I've got to do. I realize I could have a bunch of people come in here and everything, but, you know, yeah, I don't think that's necessary. So anyway, just watch, and I'll, I'll say a few things as I'm going along. But um, yeah, let me just start trimming this out of here, and then we'll get rid of it. And see, I just put all the string in one place, or all the, 
a torn up trellis in one place, and then then we'll uh, then it'll be a lot easier to deal with. And uh, it's a little bit wasteful doing this. Maybe I should save it and stuff, but I'll tell you, like I say, it's just just me doing it, and uh, I've only got so much time. Now a bunch of this is going to go into um, well, I mean, some of it I'll, I'll keep in buds, but I think I'm going to cook with a lot of this. Um, cooking continues to be appealing to me. So, oh yeah, and then the other thing is, you know, you want to keep all of these separate. I'll keep each one of these varieties separate. And the way I'll do that is I'll put them on um, different shelves. Well, I'll, I'll show you in a, in a little bit, but uh, let's see here. Let's set these scissors down. Let's start taking some of these branches out of here. I take these branches out, clean them up a little bit. But like I said, I don't have tons of time to, to do this. I don't have any harvesting machine. People keep trying to give me stuff, but I don't know. I, I haven't been taking it. Maybe I will in the future. A lot of times people try to give me old products and stuff. And usually, uh, um, well, it turns out to be an advertisement for them. So that's why I don't take it. Maybe in the future I'll start doing um, advertisements where I take, take their uh, product and they can pay me to do that. I've considered doing that, but really haven't organized it. So anyway, we've got these, these branches here. I'm just going to take these in. Well, I need some more of them. Yeah, I'll just take this plant down pretty quickly. But they come down pretty quickly. It's just all the other stuff you have to do afterwards that takes a while. Um, yeah, some of my, the people that I'm growing for uh, are going to come over, and that'll help. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to be growing for them. They're wonderful, wonderful people and good patients. And the cannabis helps them immensely. It's funny, when you get this old, it seems like, yeah, I'm 63 years old now. Can you believe it? I can't. Okay, so I'm going to just set these in on, on one of the shelves, and I'll be right back. I think this is going to be a kind of a messy thing. There's going to be plants everywhere. Oh, my God. Well, these little scissors work better for this, so I'll just use them. Yeah, these trellises are great because they just save the plants from all kinds of problems when you uh, when it's raining and stuff. Last year I had some really bad rain problems. Let me fix the clippers here. That's a big one. Now this plant's almost down. Getting it down is easy, but like I say, all that other stuff takes a while. So. And then, um, actually, it kind of feels like it's going to rain. They said it wasn't going to rain until after dark, but I don't know. The TV news also showed clouds almost here. So I think it could be a little bit early. Yeah. All right, well, that's our friend Jorge showing you how to harvest those plants. We have another video from Jorge about how to deal with powdery mold, which is something a lot of people have had this year. This has been a cooler, wetter year here in the Willamette Valley where Portland's located. Mm -hmm. And so there's been quite a bit of mold. I know you've been fighting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were just saying we're about to have a full moon. So that'll be right. our second harvest moon. Here we go. It's that about time. A couple it's about days time. here, yeah. All right, well, I'm planning on, uh, the rain is coming according to the weather forecast, yeah, which that. I watch very, very closely by the yeah, hour at this we time of year. The rain is coming on Tuesday, so, and it will stay. <clears throat> and so that's the 14th of the month. It's about time to harvest. Well, we've been and keeping our pull cover. Pull it before like, the rain starts on Tuesday. We've been keeping our cover like you suggested. You yeah. Know, we have uh, some of them in front of our garage and the others in a, in a hot house built right. on the property. If it's raining, you know, in the morning, it can be a clear sky out, 
Mm -hmm. But when it hits that dew point, there's just a mist of rain that falls down out of the clear sky when it mm. hits that dew point. I've been out there at mm. three or four in the morning when it hit and everything gets wet and that's what causes the mold around here. Huh. So uh, anyway, I uh, don't have as much a problem. I grow out in the gorge and it's pretty windy out in the gorge and a little bit drier. And so, so if you can anticipate that you can turn on some fans. Yeah, or cover it. Before, you know, or if cover it, yeah. you cover it to we stop cover. the rain from, or the mist, the, mo the dew from hitting. But uh, but we did catch some. We had to throw away, uh, I don't know, probably, we, we just, you know, as we yeah. find them, we pull them off so they don't. That's what you have to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, when we have another video we're going to run, I think it's ready. This is Jorge talking about how to deal with powdery mildew. Mm. We'll be back in a few minutes. Yeah, Watch this. Are my method. I think it's coming. It won't be long now. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. This is a 3% solution. This is the stuff you find down there at the drugstore. You find this th stuff anywhere. You know, you use it for a million different reasons. You can use it for steriliz sterilizing cuts and whatnot. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up and pour in here a cup or just a little less than a cup and a cup is eight ounces and if you look at it in milliliters it's about 230 milliliters so you can go anywhere from 200 to 250 milliliters six to eight ounces is fine but that's with the three percent solution if you have any higher concentration you don't have to put as much in so i'll take this this um hydrogen peroxide and pour it in this container and this is about five gallons here Okay, so I put it in here, five gallons, and I'm just taking ordinary, ordinary water. It's got chlorine in it and everything, you know, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to fill this up. That's good right there. That's about uh, four gallons, maybe, maybe five, more or less. We don't have to be super precise. And notice I use this air breaker nozzle on here that breaks everything up real well. It gets a little bit more air in there, kind of makes the water a bit more active. Okay, so I've got an H2O2 or a H2O2 solution here and with the water. Now the next thing, you guys have probably never seen anything like this. It may scare a few people. There we go. We're making a bath here. I'm gonna just bathe these in here for a few minutes. <laughs> kind of funny putting you putting this recently harvested cannabis in water in H2O2 water. Well, what this does is it sterilizes everything. It's like if you get a little cut or something on your hand, you know, you put that uh, hydrogen peroxide on there, you see it bubble up and stuff. Well, that's it eating the infection. Same thing's going on here. It's eating the infection. But in this case, the infection is the mildew. So this is killing it. Exactly, and that's it. It's just killing. You give this, we we'll give this a bath for, like I say, two, three minutes, maybe as long as five minutes. You can let it sit in here longer, but there's really no reason. Oh, there, you can see it. You can see all that crap. Look at this, right across the top. That scum right there is the powdery mildew. So we know that it's not on the plants. It's on the top of the water. Now I can, I can uh, take a sponge and skim that off that way I can use this water a lot longer but for just this demonstration purpose what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna skim it off but like I say use a sponge or a cloth or something and just pick that up wring your sponge out and then do it again and you get rid of that scum but look at that boy it's just building up there you can see it and that's just a few plants my god imagine if there was a whole bunch of it So the next step here is to is to pull them out of out of the water. But notice I'm not I'm not jostling them much. You know I don't want to break any of those resin glands. See now I let this drip off a little bit. Now the next move is I'm going to take this hose hose right here and water and just rinse this off. Rinse everything off. Give it a nice rinse. I don't want to get uh, I don't want to get real hard pressure on it. Just light pressure. So I make sure I kind of rinse off whatever residue might be sticking there. Okay, now I've got this bud here. I just shake it a little bit. Not much, just shake it a little bit. And I'll take that and set it up here. And I'll just do it to the next one. Rinse this real good. 
Make sure I get all the extra residue off without hurting the resin. Okay, there we go. Everything's nice and supple. Take this branch out, rinse it, hang it up. One more little guy, little guy here. <laughs> Take this little guy out, rinse him off, get all the residue off, and shake them a little bit, get the main part off. Okay, so now these are all ready to uh, turn the fan on them. I gotta turn the fan on so I get rid of most of that water. I wanna get rid of that water pretty darn quick right now. So all, I got the, the water on the outside gone, and there's just the moisture on the inside of the leaf, you know, within the plant. Because that way, if I don't get this moisture off here pretty quick, within the next, oh, two to four hours, it's gonna, it, there's a possibility of some mold, some new mold coming in. But not as much because it's already got that H2O2 on it or it's, it's been bathed with it. So let me go get the fan and then um, we'll go through that and I'll turn the fan on here, get it dried up a little bit and we'll go to the next step after that. Okay, well, I've got the fan out here. I pulled it out of, a, oh, an old garage, you know, and I haven't used it for a while, but I can see it's dirty. Man, look at that, look how dirty that is. All that creates air resistance and that makes the motor run under pressure. And we wanna get rid of all of this ugly, uh, ugly dirt on here. And oh my God, look at this, this thing is just filthy. See, I'm sure you guys have seen stuff like this in grow rooms. Let me just take this off of here real quick. Oh my God, look at that. That big bunch of hair and junk that comes out of the air, it's pretty disgusting. Well, all of that creates resistance on the motor and the motor works under stress. So it's a real good idea to keep this stuff off here. And besides, it throws a bunch of debris out into the air. So I'm gonna clean this up real quick. So I got the fan all cleaned up. It looks a lot better and I just feel better overall about it. Um, so I could put this shroud on or I could keep it off. A lot of times you can take the, just keep this shroud off and there's even less air resistance and it uh, makes your motor last longer and the fan actually puts out more, more breeze. But the thing is, you don't want to put your finger in here. It's dangerous. I do it myself, but I don't advise you to do it at home because it might hurt you. So the next thing I'm going to do is turn this fan on and uh, watch it dry the buds. Well, like I said, I want to get the, get the main, the drops of water. Anything that's like residing outside it outside of the plant, on the stem, on the leaves. And we'll just get that, get that dried up a little bit. And then after that, we'll trim it. And then we'll, we'll trim it or manicure it, manicure it, and then really let it dry. Let's hear what you have to say and what you can share with everybody else. Put it in the comments section and share your information because that's what it's all about, helping each other. And that's a good thing. Our friend and hero, Mr. Jorge Cervantes, it's amazing how well he's known around the world for all his cannabis cultivation books. And we're book. yeah, happy book. to, to have him as a long-term friend. I've known him about 35 years now. But uh, uh, we are taking call-in questions. If you're out there and you have a question for us tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4442. So you're dealing with just that right now, aren't you? Exactly. My plants out in the gorge, it's so windy, they don't have much mold. But but you're dealing with that out in, in uh, the, over toward Forest Grove. It's very minimal. The big deal was the, the broad bat. Broad, broad the broad mites. mites? Oh, God, yes. They're just devastating. You can't even see them until they're done yeah. damage. Uh, you notice of your, your your buds start to take on a sort of a amber hue. Yeah, kind of like yellow. a broccoli head or something. Yeah. And the leaves cup. They turn into these little cup things or right. something. Yeah. And they're, you can't see them without a microscope. Right. You know, so you can that make makes them, them come back, to though. If track. you put certain, there are certain products you can put on to. Yeah. Mites. I, a friend just it just advised me. He said, John, John, the best way to take care of the broad mites is you have to introduce an invasive, uh, a hostile species. Yeah, a predator mite. Pre predator, predator mites predator. can see them and they will eat them. Yeah. But that's so one good way to do it. And then the there way. are a few organic things that'll eat them up. I, yeah. But anyway, 
Uh, we are dealing with the harvest right now, and we were talking about the difference before the show of medical growers who have more than two patients, and medical growers have two mm -hmm. or less mm -hmm. patients. If you have two or less patients under Oregon law, you don't have to report to the state. Mm -hmm. If you have more than two patients, you have to buy these little plastic RFD tags and a scanner, and you have to report when you harvest the plant, and you have to report how much it weighs wet and how much it dries down to, and you have to report, I'm going to give it to a patient, then you report that you're taking it to the patient, then you report that you've delivered it to the patient. It's just an endless stream of reports, and you know, I'm doing this for free, folks, because I love to do it. But another thing is we have to pay this $480 a year, a year. fee uh, to, to register for this make work scenario. To pay to help and people. for me personally, that was very hard financially this year. There have been years before where that wouldn't have made any difference at all. But since I've been through this corporate takeover thing and it seems that the Marlboro Tobacco Company owns everything I started in my life now, uh, they uh, uh, have taken away my ability to pay my bills, and, I'm, uh, but, and so I had, I had to pay the $480 metric fee or all my patients would be canceled and their licenses would be canceled and their garden would be gone. So I paid the $480 fee, but I could not afford to pay my own grower fee of an extra $200. Each patient has to pay this $200 fee, so I'm just being broke financially and you know and and it's just all this busy make work and you know people are dying from inhaling these vape cartridges and these guys don't pay any attention to that they're too worried about our little medical gardens even though they profited off this for years Oregon medical marijuana was producing 25 million dollars a year for the state mm -hmm. You know, and well, uh, you to don't <clears throat> have to do that because you just grow in for yourself. And, and well, we family. still have a, we still have an interest. You know, uh, I I would like to have exercise the option to be able to do something. Uh, you know, we we put our we put our lives. My wife and I both put our lives into this thing. Uh, uh, certainly not as heavily as some, and, and as great as some. You know, but we've been willing to sacrifice our lives and go out and protest and. <laughs> Do everything we can to, you know, disrupt our lives to make it better, and through that we we find that uh, now uh, we are dealing with people who are treating us like the enemy, like we're gonna. We're, and I keep asking the OLCC, I keep <coughs> asking the same question: Where is the harm? Exactly. Where is the exactly. harm? Exactly. Show me the harm. Somebody, please. Why are we chasing? Why are we chasing this you ghost? Know, like there's this, there's this big nasty animal out there that's going to kill everybody. It's nothing. It's there's a, a it's question. A lie. Will the governor and our state legislatures continue to throw patients under the bus just so they can collect I mean, more like, tax like revenue? Been doing, yes, Patient registrations dropped from 77,000 patients down to under 30,000 patients now. Mm -hmm. OMMP growers used to provide nearly free medicine to all these patients mm -hmm. at no cost to the taxpayer. Medical growers actually contributed $25 million to the general fund. And then the growers. But they're being driven out by insane overregulation. And overpriced the, cannabis yeah, also. The OLCC up. was tasked with creating a program for low income patients, but it has failed miserably. The legislature created the Oregon Cannabis Commission to preserve and restructure the OMMP, but so far, the legislature's ignored it. The governor won't meet with the commission, and the legislature is giving the OLCC another try since liquor regulators know so much about helping patients, you know. <laughs> Will small family oh farms and mom and pop stores survive the consolidation and corporatization of this industry? We know that uh, Rudy Giuliani, the New York City mayor, it's just come out that he was helping these Ukrainians, Lev and Igor, mm -hmm. get into the Nevada market. They were spending millions of dollars to bribe people in Nevada to get into the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. Will Oregon continue to require cannabis farmers to waste tens of millions of dollars reporting the wet weight of every marijuana plant and tagging them all with expensive plastic tags? Meanwhile, the OLC only realized that cannabis was the safest thing in these vape pens after they, a number of people died from the additives. The this entire metric tracking system is a sham pretending to di prevent diversion 
but completely ignoring any issues related to public health. Growing your own is really the only option these days. If you can't find someone like me who can afford to grow for you, and my accountants told me that I used to spend $120,000 a year to grow and give away yeah. marijuana to hundreds of patients each year, about 600 pounds a year. I can't afford to do that anymore, but I'm That's still able That's very sad because that, so. that means people are suffering. Yeah. Uh, more people are suffering. And meanwhile, these guys, they'll sit there all smug and think that, I think that they actually believe that they're doing good for us. You're not. You're hurting us. You're insulting us. You're, like Paul said, throwing us under the bus. We don't fit in your tiny little cookie hole cutter version of what a pot smoker should be. Besides that, we're not all just pot smokers. We use cannabis as a medicine. Amen. We have another fine gentleman, an Oregon lawyer, He's worked with National Normal. His name is John Lucy. He was at our uh, Global Cannabis March last year, and we have a little video with him. We're going to run that right now. We'll be right back. So I want to talk to everybody today about a couple things. The big things I want to talk to people today about are prison, incarceration, compassion, and making this a better place for us. Not only here in Oregon, where it's really, 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 really wonderful, and I hope you all realize that. Right now, I've got enough marijuana in my pocket to send me to prison for the rest of my life in certain places in the United States, okay? So I want you to understand that. You're living in a place right now where marijuana is very, very legal. There's a lot of people in this country who don't have that. They don't have that ability. And so what I want to talk about today, and one of the people I really want to talk about, is Bernard Noble. Does anybody here know who Bernard Noble is? Raise your hand if you know who Bernard Noble is. I got you, Russ. I got my team over here. I got Raphael over here. I got anybody else. Anybody else here who's done five plus years in prison? Anybody? You back there. Come up for a minute. I want you to come up. It's important. And you don't have to, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to say anything about you specifically, but I want people to understand something here. We've got this man here who's done over five years in prison. Understand that. Bernard Noble, Louisiana. 13-year minimum mandatory sentence. Can anybody tell me how much marijuana Mr. Noble had on him when he was sentenced to 13 years in prison for a mandatory minimum? Ms. Johnson, come up here. That much marijuana. This sent a man to prison for 13 goddamn years. Okay? A lot of lawyers worked really hard. A lot of people worked really hard. A lot of advocates worked really hard. Can anyone tell me how much time Mr. Noble actually served? Seven years. Seven goddamn years in prison for an amount of marijuana. Can you hold that up for me, Ms. Johnson? That amount of marijuana sent a man to prison for seven years in this country right now, okay? That's what we're living with in America. This, this bottle right here. This is 30 years to life in Mississippi. This is what stops people's seizures. This is what stops people from being in chronic pain all day. This is what stops people from hurting every day of their life. And for some of us out there, it just makes us feel good after work so we don't have to drink three shots of whiskey, okay? So, I wanna be really clear. We live in an amazing place in Oregon. Any one of you who's 21 years of age or older or 18 and older and a medical patient can walk into a store and buy this. This was given to me today by someone who has the right to make it because Oregon has home grow. We have the right to grow your own medicine or recreation as you see fit, and we fought really hard for that privilege. Not every state has that. Every state will have that. That will happen. That day will come back because that day was not that long ago. We will end marijuana prohibition entirely in this country. One day at a time, one person at a time, one prisoner at a time. I want you to understand though, I want you, everyone in here to think for a moment. This gentleman spent five plus years in prison, okay? What I want right now from everyone here is something really simple, and it's silence. I want everyone here to take 30 seconds and I want you to think about what it would be like to spend the next five years of your life in prison for the amount of marijuana that I'm holding in my hand. Okay? I'm going to time it. I'm going to shut up. It's really rare that I shut up. So starting now, 30 seconds of silence.
You just did 30 seconds. The man who just walked off the stage did five years. Bernard Noble did seven years, four months and a couple days. And he's still, he's on parole. He's still getting drug tested every month. He's still in the position that if he screws up in the slightest, if he so much as runs a red light, that man's back in prison over two grams of marijuana. So I want everyone here today to think about what it would be like to spend that amount of time in a metal cage over a plant, because that's what we're still dealing with in America. Every single one of you here today has the right to rock around as long as you're an adult with an ounce of marijuana in your pocket and no one gets to say much else to you. And that's a wonderful privilege that we live in such a place, but it's not finished. Just because it's done here doesn't mean it's done everywhere else. I don't know if you notice or not, but my accent ain't from here. I'm originally from North Carolina. My family members died in prison, okay? I had friends and family who were in cages. They went there for years and years and years for an amount of marijuana that, honestly, people in stores here throw on a counter and can sell to you. I want you to understand that we have it really, really good. We have it amazing in Oregon. We have a system here that rivals any in the U.S. Are we going to make it better? Yes. There are problems with it. Everyone here knows if you're involved in this fight that it's not perfect. But what I want you to understand is that when people come here from Mississippi, when they come here from Louisiana. It's a good place to come from. I uh, lived uh, my high school years in North Carolina, but grew up in Texas before that. And uh, both of those are a good place to be from. I can tell you it's good to be here in Oregon. I've been here since 1984. And we're going to keep working to legalize marijuana all around the world. We're working for global cannabis freedom. I want to thank you folks for watching. Mr. John Cornette is going to play us a song, Go Out, and help us restore hemp tonight. Another chapter as we turn the page And we exist within a nuclear age I know that freedom's heard around the globe Just where our future lies Well, nobody knows Whoa You never know when the sky will fall Maybe the moon will reach the earth one day We're not the same race that we used to be Can't you see? Now the next time that you fall in love Just appreciate the sun above the sun is shining on and on so open up your eyes before it's gone. Whoa, let's make the best of it now.